Hey, Edsel, and today, whoop de doo I'm, I'm dressed for battle, so let's do this. Uh, today I'm going to come with you with a game design presentation, and I gotta say that this one is, is kind of a doozy. This is part two of my feedback to Blizzard with my focus on class design in the World of Warcraft. Now this is my follow-up with, um, basically on how it's pretty busted, uh, from the awkward level pacing to the more awkward addition uh, and subtraction of abilities over the past however the heck many years. In part one of this series, I pointed these out and many of you agreed with me, which is great. And in fact, when looking around, I find that my critiques against class design are widely shared in different circles. So I guess I can say with some confidence that we are united on that front. Woohoo! But today, I want to follow up on that earlier piece with some more specific suggestions on just how class design can be improved in WoW uh, almost from the ground up. And I can say again with some confidence that we, as in you person at home or on the toilet who's watching and listening to this, we're not going to be united on this front because we all have so many different and fantastic and well thought out ideas on how to revamp or otherwise fix class design. What I'm going to present to you today is just a sample of what is possible. First, let me do a quick recap of the earlier video. Class design in WoW these days feels awkward, arbitrary, and dated. The old talent tree system wasn't perfect by any means, but it did allow at least a feeling of customization, and it did help tell the story of growth for our characters. Today's rows of talents are used sort of like a place to dump passives and abilities without much or any consideration for our character's growth. This is highlighted by the Legion and the Battle for Azeroth expansions, where a class's powers and abilities felt borrowed. And that's because the expansion features were designed as borrowed powers to later be taken away. The challenges in current class design are numerous. The biggest challenges that I'm going to address today sum up to the following. The series of granting abilities one expansion and then pruning them in the next to avoid bloat. The watering down of customization and class depth due to limitations with the current talent system. And the lack of feeling growth as classes develop throughout WoW's timeline thanks to so-called expansion features. By the end of this video, I'm going to have presented a revamped class design concept that you may find, well, that you may find controversial. It's going to cover the points that I just talked about, but don't be surprised if you come out either impressed or offended or a little bit of both. Believe me when I say that I don't have any illusions about this presentation. This is Fan fiction, this is wishful thinking, and there's more to improving the world of Warcraft than just class design. This is just the topic for today. And I ask that you please keep an open mind uh, during this presentation and to share your thoughts in a comment below. Revamping class design with a game that has 14 years of history means there's a lot to work with, but unfortunately that also means that there's a lot to work with. The challenge that I set for myself was pretty straightforward. How do I take all the past and present abilities, talents, traits, 120 levels and 7 expansions and somehow make a better system? The first was to set a few priorities. Priority number one, arguably the most important, is to make this new progression system withstand the test of time. So if 10 more WoW expansions come out, the system still needs to endure, otherwise I'd come back with another video, hey it's soul, yeah whatever. The next is to ensure that this concept greatly reduces the need to prune, as in the taking away of buttons or methods of customization. And at the same time it has to grow, it has to become a little bit more complex with each existing expansion and expansions afterwards, but still it needs to not become too bloated or cumbersome. So how do we add, but not add? It was a really interesting challenge. But it was the third priority that became the starting point that got me super excited about doing this. It's to take the sense of class growth and have it make sense uh, to both the player and to the lore of the World of Warcraft. In other words, I'm taking the approach that class design is equivalent to telling a story. So this right here, the talent system, is what we have now. There are many suggestions that have summed up to a simple solution, namely to add new talent rows uh, each expansion and effectively deepen the system. This makes sense. It even sounds exciting at first glance. Unfortunately though, another few rows of talents, it might feel good now, but it doesn't show any consideration for the past nor the future of Warcraft. 
that's because with this talent system, the abilities keep getting shuffled around all willy-nilly. The talent rows don't really tell a story. They're more like a semi-logical placement of choices that was decided by the invisible hand of the developer. I think I'm gonna need some help to explain this, but don't worry, it's not Bob. Oh, bad. I'm gonna pull up this human avatar, and we're going to call him... Rick. Rick the Paladin. And between this presentation of how to redo WoW's class design, we're gonna take Rick on a journey. Because that's what an RPG is, it's a journey. You know, started from the bottom, and now we are... Uh, <laughs> I already messed that up, damn. So Rick is level 1. He just walked out of Northshire, ready for action. For the next 10 or so levels, he's your basic paladin, crushing enemies with Crusader Strike until he learns a few other abilities like Judgment, or Flash of Light, or Hammer of Justice. And then, well, he hits level 10, and now a path lay before good old Rick. Is he going to heal, tank, do damage? How will this hero's story be written? Rick will choose to be a tank because, well, obviously, me, tank, that's... That's kind of my thing, it's easy for me to talk about it that way, duh. Specializations are another debated topic in WoW, and it's very important for this conversation. Consider the talent trees from Vanilla to Lich King, and today's current iteration of specializations. This does limit customization, and it otherwise prevents true hybrid builds. But for now, I'm going to sidestep that, and hope that the rest of this presentation makes a good enough case as to why I'm doing that. So grats, Rick, you're a tank, woo! And Rick starts going off on his adventures in the Eastern Kingdoms and Kalimdor, leveling up, getting some gear, earning all sorts of abilities. Before you know it, he's level 40. He's able to summon his faster mount, and he's about to learn Light of the Protector, which is one of the major abilities of the Protection Paladin. There's one thing Rick hasn't learned yet, though. It's, well, where'd the talents go? Rick didn't learn any talents up until now because talents as we know it aren't going to exist anymore. There's no rows. There's no trees, they're just not there. They're going to be elsewhere, and you'll find out where in just a moment. Once Rick reaches another milestone, let's just say it's level 41 for the sake of it, something really cool happens. He teaches himself a new ability. This ability is called Hammer of the Righteous. For folks in my circle, this ability sounds really familiar. In fact, we should have had it already, because in today's WoW, Hammer of the Righteous is learned at level 10 as soon as you spec into pr the protection spec. What was once Crusader Strike simply transforms into Hammer of the Righteous and has some cool little benefits to it. But in this reimagining of WoW, Rick is going to learn Hammer of the Righteous at level 41 or so, and now he's presented with a choice. A new kind of ability UI will pop up, displaying all of his specializations, I guess I'll just call them signature skills. There's Crusader Strike hanging out, but there's also a notification that Rick discovered a new ability. All Rick has to do is click on Crusader Strike and then select his first modified ability, Hammer of the Righteous. With this action, Rick swaps out the higher single target damage of Crusader Strike with the AoE punch of Hammer of the Righteous. From there on, as Rick continues to level, he'll learn new abilities and discover new modifications or mods for existing abilities. And by the time he hits level 60, his UI is now fully lit up with all of his signature abilities, and each of them is going to have one available modification. Let's take a look at a few. Avenger Shield can be augmented with the very familiar first Avenger ability, which will increase damage taken from the first target that was hit. We already went through changing Crusader Strike into Hammer of the Righteous. Uh, judgment can turn into Judgments of Light, which can give you some uh, self and a little bit of group healing. That's nice. I mean, <laughs> it's not super awesome, but, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. Devotion Aura, because, hey, I just decided, hey, let's give, let's give Prop Paladin's Devotion Aura again. Um, that can be modified into Retribution Aura if they wanted to, which not only does the familiar damage return, but it also increases all damage done from the Paladin by a couple of percent, but it happens to reduce armor. You get that kind of trade-off. And finally, Consecration can be modded into Consecrated Ground, and we're familiar with that talent today. It makes Consecration bigger, and it snares enemies. It's pretty much identical to what we have now. So what actually happened here in this UI, and what happens in the story of Rick? One is that I did an ability learning squish. Normally, all the baseline abilities are learned at level 80, and in this case, Rick will learn all the signature paladin skills by level 60. 
Now I'd like you to put on your role play kind of glasses. So if you think of this as a story, you can think of Rick as having journeyed across Azeroth, crushing the bad guys, winning gold, and learning just about all the basics to becoming a good old paladin. In fact, in a few small ways, he's teaching himself to grow on his own by discovering these new possibilities with these ability mods. Of course, at this point, he's only level 60 and the choices are pretty darn limited. There's still 60 whole levels to go. Going forward, this UI just won't be the basis for ability customization, but it'll serve as a tapestry for displaying character growth. As Rick continues leveling through the expansions, he's going to discover new mods every few levels, and slowly, this adds to the customization depth. This helps maintain that feeling of growth where currently there are really big and inconsistent gaps. Take Consecration, for example. One of the early mods, like I said, is Consecrated Ground, but at higher levels, different mods become available. Maybe it can be modified into a short-range AoE heal, just like how it was in previous expansions. Or it can follow you, just like previous expansions. Or, and this is going to be a wild one, so, so stay with me here. Imagine Rick taking Consecration and instead of it being like this pulsing out AoE ability, he instead channels the fires of holy light uh, into his weapon, his hammer, whatever, and he decks it over the face of the enemy for some additional damage as well as some damage over time. Now this sounds very familiar because once upon a time there was a very similar or I guess identical ability called Sealed of Truth. So maybe... <laughs> Again, stay with me here. Maybe Consecration can have a mod called Seal of Truth. It's kind of wild. From a gameplay perspective, this is like the full sacrifice of AoE damage for having a higher single target dot. But let's look into more of the design of turning one ability into another. Maybe the buff that grants you Seal of Truth can have a long duration like it did before it was pruned, so you can almost consider this like a passive. Or, considering that the base ability, Consecration, had a short cooldown, Seal of Truth can require regular recasting on occasion, just like the good old days, if you want to call it that. It's different. It's situational. It is a rotation changer. And that is the direction that I'm trying to take, where each of these selected abilities becomes its own kind of talent row, if you want to visualize it that way. With an approach like this, there's the potential for drawing upon 14 years of abilities and talents. But there doesn't necessarily have to be an additional round of mods made available to every signature ability, every expansion all the time, no. But this, gives, but, but this does give Blizzard a chance to take these previously pruned talents and abilities and to take them out of retirement. Meanwhile, the number of active abilities on our hotbars doesn't necessarily change. Alone though, this system would feel a little bit stale. Paladins like Rick, it's like, ooh, they can throw shields with their left hand instead of their right. That's, that's great. So, <laughs> so let's take this a step further and see how Rick's selections can become a little bit more sophisticated. Part of the fun of roleplaying is messing around with builds. In this design concept, players can mess around with these mods for in order to suit a given situation, to develop like a style or personality of their character, or both. As Rick levels up, he's going to learn new mods, and he'll discover new synergies depending on what combination of uh, mods he uses. The discovery can be really subtle, or it can be just very clear to the player with just a menu selection. Here's one example. Rick can change Judgment to Judgment of Light, a debuff that causes attacks against the target to heal the attacker. He also changes Light of the Protector, which is the Paladin self-heal, into a passive called Seal of Light, which obviously takes away the on-demand self-heal Paladins are used to these days, and instead greatly increases the Paladin's Leech. Again, this is just an example, don't talk to me about Leech in the comments, okay? But by activating both of these mods, a new trait will activate, a passive called Battle Healer. This is going to make Rick's melee attacks heal nearby party or raid members based on the damage dealt. But not only that, it's going to make their abilities heal nearby party or raid members as well for a fixed amount. Now is this like a huge bonus? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but this is an example of how a paladin can sacrifice their self-healing for raid healing because it's either a good idea or they just want to feel cool. 
So, as players like Rick level up and progress from expansion to expansion, they're going to discover more mods, and with that, more possible synergies. Some synergies might be based on mods that come from the same expansion, but there could be an instance where, let's say in Battle for Azeroth, you discover a new mod, and that happens to synergize with something all the way back from the Burning Crusade. This is where I'm trying to sell on the depth and the sophistication of any given class, not because there are more buttons to press, but because there are more options and combinations that are made available as time goes on. Think for a moment on the transition from Legion to Battle for Azeroth. With it came the loss of artifacts and legendaries, and the shuffling of these artifact abilities. Maybe they're just gone. But if reimagined under this concept, Rick's Paladin will leave his artifact weapon behind, but maybe while leveling in Battle for Azeroth, he learns the Bulwark of Order mod, which lets his Avenger Shield apply an absorption bubble based on damage done. Or, Art and Defender can turn into a variation of Eye of Tear, which was the protection artifact ability. Legion makes a really good example of borrowing great power to defeat the enemy and then relinquishing it. That might be the World of Warcraft story, but in Rick's story, you know, maybe he can still come away having learned a new trick or two. That's what I think makes this system really awesome. It allows the opportunity for Blizzard to design these so-called expansion features or temporary powers like artifacts, legendaries, um, Azerite gear. We can even apply this to like trinkets, set bonuses, and so on. We can take all these things, design them, knowing that in some way, shape, or form, they're not necessarily going to go away forever. They can just be shuffled into a modification later on. While I was designing this, I kind of thought to myself, well, you know, another way to approach this is to take the current rows of talents and instead of making them deeper, to just make them wider. You can broaden the choices without causing bloat. However, the current limitations of the talent rows, it, it, it just doesn't make that depth very impactful. Now, I don't find this approach very revolutionary or groundbreaking, but I do see it as a fresh new beginning by approaching class design as it should have been from the beginning. Just a story. Characters like Rick learn the ropes during the 1 through 60 experience. And as he and others move on to other chapters of the World of Warcraft story, they learn new tricks. They take these abilities that they learned many moons ago, and they become more sophisticated, and they create for themselves a new identity. Unless, of course, they go to like icy veins and they just boop, 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 and pull up, hey, what's the highest throughput build? Ah, there we go. So let's move on to a few of the many challenges to this concept that will need some consideration. One is something that you might have noticed already, and I hope that I don't regret pointing this out, but this system looks a lot like, or it seems to work a lot similarly to the Diablo 3 rune system, does it not? Ugh. Mods are tied to abilities, the depth is horizontal and not vertical, there are synergies, you know, that sort of thing. I don't think that it's really a negative, but for some critics who really have an axe to grind with Blizzard over the whole Diablo whatever it is, this sort of comparison might make some people see red. Uh, I, I don't agree with that, but like I said, it's something to consider. Also, when considering the implementation of this system, what about classes that don't have a 1 through 60 experience, hmm? Death Knights and Demon Hunters especially would quickly feel bombarded with all these numerous mods and that risks compromising the idea of story that I'm trying to sell. Another challenge is that in order to implement this, well, folks, we would be breaking WoW once again. I'd love to think that all it takes to revamp class design is like a few tweaks here and there, ta-da, and that everything would be like solved, but that's anything but realistic. Leveling for the most part is going to be redone all over again. Talents will be essentially gone, and players will have to retrain themselves on what the heck is their class about now. Blizzard will also need to end up going back and re-implementing all these old abilities and talents depending on what they choose, and the balancing, well, dang, the balancing, whew, that's going to be a lot of work, but I never see that as an excuse to say no to a challenge, especially if in the long term this could pay off. Despite all these efforts, if this system went through as is, I'm sure that there would be a website that will easily deconstruct all the mods and synergies and just dumb everything down to a simple, hey, use this loadout for this or that situation, or you're bad. In my opinion though, that doesn't mean the system is weak, it's simply the internet doing its duty of informing. But if I had to choose, 
I would rather see the complaints over the meta of these mods and synergies feeling unbalanced than to continue seeing abilities come in and then be taken away, only to leave us wondering what did we ever have. And then there's the greatest challenge of all, of course. You may not like it. It's almost impossible for me to not have a skewed view of this approach because it's based on my own dissatisfactions and my desires for the current game. I probably missed something that you, person, are very passionate about. Now, I, I get that this isn't going to fix everything, but in my opinion, it definitely sets the groundwork for more engaging gameplay with an eye for growth and the long-term future of WoW. There's also the other greatest challenge of all, I guess I just made this up, but if this concept were to become reality, this is it. This is going to be how classes develop in WoW for the next however the heck many years. Game design is a process of constant evolution, but Ian has said time and time again that Blizzard is looking at the world of Warcraft in the long term, so they'd be, they would need to be ready to double down and, and, and hold on to this kind of system for many, many years. Can they do it? There are many areas of opportunity that the world of Warcraft can improve on. As a fan and a commentator, I want to throw a few ideas out there, and I hope that it reaches the ear of a designer, or two, or all of them. And if it doesn't, then there's always the next video. This ends my presentation, and I want to thank all of you very, very much for letting me share this idea with you. I'm happy, of course, to discuss uh, more armchair design uh, in the comments below, but otherwise, uh, help me out by liking the video if you enjoyed yourself, of course. And if this concept does get you excited, share it with Blizzard to help them out. Well, and us too, I suppose, but oh well. I'll see you next time. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and stay breezy.